To suffer terribly and to know yourself as the cause, that is hell. That's... You know, I think we're going to see a lot of filings come out for uh, Ethereum. I even think we might see something for Ripple, given uh, the recent progress. Uh, you notice that Grayscale just added Ripple to one of their trusts that's publicly traded. So it wouldn't surprise me if we saw Ripple or Ethereum spot ETFs out there. I really don't know if we're going to do that or not. I think those are more retail plays and people have other ways to access them. But uh, given, given that this, this market, anything could happen, anything could happen. Grayscale recently added XRP to the Grayscale Trust, which is an altcoin trust. They have various altcoins that they put in a trust. The difference between an ETF and a trust is a trust has really heavy premiums and it's not convertible to the other assets. So you'd have to sell for dollars and get, and get the other assets. With the Bitcoin ETF per se, you'd be able to trade the Bitcoin ETF for actual underlying Bitcoin. Cop the really tricky tautology that we all end up in, and 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 I'll put it all under the under the, the sort of banner of convergence. Is like we're going to need the traditional system, and we're going to need the new system, and they're going to have to figure out how to meld into the brand new system. Like there is no world in which tradfi is, it exists as it exists, and there's an alternative second system over here. That there is a world in which that will converge to create the new system and it will be better. It will undoubtedly be better than the one we had before. But when we get to that point and people stop thinking about, well, I'm going to be really defensive and say everything needs to be centralized. Well, that's not, that's not going to work. Same over here in traditional finance. Well, none of that DeFi stuff's ever going to work. Well, in which case you're a dinosaur and you're going out of business. The people who really get it right will take the best of both worlds and sort of allow for this to evolve. Uh, and ultimately, if you give these big institutional pools of capital the ability to go get in and, and while, this, while the price action will continue to do what it's doing, that's going to be the transformative element. The, the retail did its job years ago and over the last few years. Now we need the institutional machine to kick in. And Bitcoin ETF is, is really the big sort of starting gun for that. You understand what he's saying is that retail brought crypto to a level where it was liquid. Now that it's being regulated, now that there's opportunities for the big guys, now the big guys can ease into the market, make money, and move the needle all at the same time. This is a very bullish scenario for the entire crypto world. Now, the guy speaking is head of Six Digital Asset Exchange in Switzerland. He's met with Chris Larson, he's met with Ripple's head honcho, so to speak, and he's telling you the, the game plan that he sees being, being played out. Be in no particular order, be like, right, well, the pick, there's, a, there's a slowly pick up in the traditional head fund community getting involved in Bitcoin in particular as a macro asset class. So that means... Yes, no wonder BlackRock really wants to get an ETF out there because that will be used as a macro hedging asset. That will be used in, in significant volume as a macro trading asset for the traditional community. So what does he mean by a macro hedging asset? Well, all of these institutions, they have formulas for risk and reward. So having something where they can hedge their bets, that means that they just buy, buy some to hedge their bets. And that puts price appreciation. That's how price appreciation happens, is people buying things. Now, if Bitcoin and Bitcoin ETF is a way to hedge whatever risky bets they're taking, that puts buy pressure on a asset class that only has 21 million coins. Before we continue the show, I'd like to take a moment to thank NordVPN. NordVPN is a sponsor of this show, and what they offer is a VPN service that allows you to conceal your IP address. This can protect you from DDoS attacks or man-in-the-middle attacks. It really is a very useful tool. It also helps you find content that's not available in your jurisdiction. So be sure to check out nordvpn.com slash Darren. We're starting to see the crypto natives who survived get more interest from allocators. Like yep. I've, all the big guys that I've talked to in the last few weeks, and we're all saying the same thing. Like, like the interest is picking up. You're getting the big traditional players with the big wealth management assets. And by the way, this is one of the areas that I think people just haven't really cottoned onto. Like 
There's trillions and trillions of wealth being managed by UBS, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, you know, uh, insert the, the top 10. Like, that is an enormous amount of client money that if 1% of that wanted to get into this space, it's going to move the needle by like a lot, right? That's happening. Mm-hmm. I, I, so the survivors, the altcoin survivors, the projects with utility, the projects that are trying to accomplish something, if 1% of the traditional money comes into the crypto world, it's going to move the needle. It's going to push prices up. That's what Tim is saying. Oh, I, I am not challenged and we are not challenged about where to put money. It's actually, it's actually the, other, the other way around. It's like, well, how do we... How do we narrow it down to the things we want to bet on? There's loads of quality I'm seeing out there, and that has to be the most encouraging element of all. These guys know their business very well, and he's saying that there are loads of projects that they don't even know where to put their money because there's so many great projects out there. Americans to use a digital dollar and convince them that there isn't a government backdoor built into it, even if I can technologically prove it. Um, there's just a lack, there's just a kind of trust and marketing that will have to be done. Um, but that's why there needs to be research and development around it. Um, and ultimately, the population may change um, on thinking around that. And wholesale is definitely ripe for experimentation. There's a lot of work being done and driven by a lot of Asia Pacific nations, actually, related to CBDC experiments that are going on um, in the BIS Innovation Hub. When digital dollars emerge, the public needs to trust that there are no back doors, that they cannot have their, their dollars frozen. And that kind of goes against the whole entire U.S. banking system. Now, a way to do this is to host dollars on public blockchains, on things like the XRP Ledger, Hedera, or Ethereum, whatever. If you were to put dollars directly on blockchains and you give up the right to freeze assets, that is how you can restore confidence that money won't be seized. Yeah, I mean, as you've seen that, you've seen them, uh, Xi Jinping and, and his uh, comrades move around the world uh, trying to, begging the Middle East to settle oil and RMB because, as you know, they're, they're, if this were to happen and the US were to actually sanction someone, you know, our sanctions on Russia uh, were, were not even a 5% sanction. We, we didn't touch their energy business, we left their banks on SWIFT. We let Russians freely travel around the world. I mean, we really didn't do anything to Russia uh, to inhibit their ability to operate. Um, but I do think if we were to properly sanction China on this maneuver, they need 12 million barrels of crude oil every day. They need eight BCF of LNG every day. They import 40% of their food every day and they have to buy it in dollars. So, Andrew, they've got to figure out how to piece together uh, willing global trading partners that won't adhere to US sanctions. So, it's very complicated uh, for them. But again, if you listen to Xi Jinping and forget about the media and whatever you read, just read his speeches since 2017. Right. He tells you what he's going to do. Let, let me ask you a different question. On the global stage, nobody can trust each other. Everybody is positioning to get around U.S. sanctions or U.S. dollar hegemony. Everybody is positioning in this fashion. BRICS nations are branching off, creating their own separate economy. Now, the economy, the global economy is, is kind of, has homeostasis. It needs to keep an equilibrium. When you take five or six countries that are major oil producers and push them off the map, there tends to be hiccups. And that's why we saw inflation spike as high as we have. Central banks and governments printing money is a new concept. Fiat has, has only been around for since the 1970s. However, it's been tried in the, in the past and has failed. And, and we always go back full circle. We always go back to commodity-based money or some type of, of, of money that's backed by something. But you see, with, with crypto assets, there are protocols that are controlled by the people, for the people, and the best interest of the collective. Uh, are Russia and the United States are both uh, de facto becoming more aggressive, more escalatory um, via this dismantling of the treaties and uh, these protections that were built consciously 50, 60 years ago against the use of nuclear weapons? I mean, are, are, we, are we on a really scary path here? Yeah. 
without the American public, and I would say probably without 90% of our elected leaders knowing it, we re-entered an arm, a nuclear arms race with Russia in 2004, 2006, somewhere that time frame when we withdrew from ABM. This is not just a nuclear arms race. This is a technological war. This is a financial war, economic, currency, everything. Everything is at stake, and it keeps escalating. We keep pushing the envelope, and not just us, every country in the world is in this area of complete distrust. It is about all the Russian experts in 2024 will be a big year for cross-border crypto CBDC payment. So notice that it's not just CBDC, right? We're, we're talking about crypto and CBDC because if CBDC by itself is not very useful. You need convertibility, you need oracles, you need things to make CBDCs useful. Fiat inside of a crypto ecosystem is a very useful tool. So this comes from Andre Tugarin, and he is from GMT Legal, which is a Russian law firm. And they said the main trend to look out for in 2024 will be the use of digital assets to make cross-border payments. Then it goes in a little bit deeper. Um, now this next person says that... In 2024, we expect the launch of an experimental platform, an experimental platform for the use of cryptocurrency and digital financial assets for international payments. I believe that both the market and the ordinary citizens expect this. And this is from Maria Telingenia. Russia's central bank was stockpiling gold prior to them being sanctioned. You see, they were sanctioned prior to this, so they they already knew what was coming. It's it's like a it's like a criminal that that already knows how the police work. They they understand what was happening. So when Russia's scholars are saying that in 2024 you're going to see digital currencies take place, at the same time. BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF is going to pass and uh, a bunch of other bullish news coming out. It leads me to believe that there is something bigger at play that, that people just don't quite understand. And it goes back to what Tim was saying, that this is a macro hedge asset. And crypto assets are completely free of a banking system. Yeah, you can integrate them into a banking system. But at the end of the day, these are these are 12 words that I can remember that could store billions of dollars. I, I mean, these are rails built on the internet that are more secure, more efficient. The regulations can be determined by the collective. When you hear the term governance for crypto, that's what that means, is the collective is figuring out the rules of the road. I think this unipolar world is going to break apart into a multipolar world and these distributed ledgers, these blockchains are going to be, are going to be the middle ground, how the world operates. There's going to be rules, but it's going to be the rules of the collective, not the United States, not a bully tactic, but there's going to be votes that take place uh, on protocols. There's a catch, Nate, and it gets to the question that you brought up earlier of why countries don't trust us. Well, you know, in the U.S. and under our Constitution, there's two steps to a treaty. The administration, whoever's president, his administration has to sign it, but then Congress, specifically the Senate, has to ratify it. Well, in our system, and you know how dysfunctional we are internally, just look at what's happened in the House of Representatives the last few weeks. and between the political parties, getting treaties through the Senate has been a very difficult time. And so the te Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty was signed in 96 by the Clinton administration. It was never ratified, which means it does not have the force of law. So the U.S. never actually became a full participant in that treaty. Russia has been warning since 2004 with increasing urgency, look, you need to ratify this treaty commit to it legally, or we're done. We're not, gonna, we're not going to participate anymore. And after this test, the eight, so in, I believe it was in August, the Duma passed uh, a law withdrawing from the treaty. 
And so their system is actually similar to ours in that the president can't sign or abrogate a treaty on his own. He can sign it, but it's not legal until the parliament, in Russia's case, the Duma, passes off on it. So in August, the Duma said, okay, we want to withdraw from this treaty. Putin kind of held that in his pocket as leverage to try to say, look, don't go forward with this test. The U.S. went forward with it anyway. And so Putin signed it, and now Russia has uh, revoked their ratification of the treaty. The U.S. is acting as a unipower of the world. Rules for thee, but not for me. We're weaponizing the dollar, and BRICS nations are branching off to create their own economy. By creating a separate economy, the seniorage from the U.S.-dominated system will drastically be reduced. The technology of CBDC and crypto assets allow countries not to rely on SWIFT or U.S. correspondent banks. While distrust is in every area, nuclear technology, trade embargoes, everything, protocols that incentivize fairness have emerged. If a country produces $10 billion worth of goods, it's not like they will stop producing those goods. In other words, it doesn't matter what goods are priced in. Most countries won't be affected because the productive capacity is there. What will matter is the U.S. losing the reserve status and a bilateral swaps becoming dominant. The economy at large goes from centralized U.S. systems to a decentralized system of peer-to-peer -peer trading. This is a massive shift, and it is for the better. Throughout history, empires have risen and fallen. That doesn't mean the U.S. completely breaks, but it does mean that the tax that we impose on the world, the exorbitant privilege, lessens. There's that the notion of natural disaster in some sense is ill conceptualized because there's, there's a ambiguity about whether when a disaster occurs, it's a consequence of the hand of God, say, in the earthquake or the flood, or the utter failure of the authorities to have prepared properly for a foreseeable disaster. No, I thought this very clearly when Katrina hit New Orleans, because a hue and cry went up about the catastrophe of the natural disaster, but you didn't have to dig very far before you realized that the reason that that hurricane was so devastating in New Orleans was because well, the dikes hadn't been maintained and they'd only been built to withstand a one-in-one-century flood and that the entire infrastructure of the society was corrupt. And so, you know, in, in mythological representations, in deep narratives, there is an identity between the evil king and the wicked queen of nature. They're the same thing. And so if the king gets wicked enough, the evil queen of nature arises. And that's a representation of the fact that if your state is corrupt, natural disaster will definitely make itself shown and that you actually can't distinguish. There's no distinction between lack of preparation and a natural disaster in the final analysis. And corruption and blindness facilitate that, that nexus. So the debt levels are out of control. The corrupt king and the wicked queen there is no distinction between the two. You don't know which, which one is responsible for the downfall of society. But what he's saying is that a natural disaster strikes, which would be the feminine evil queen, and the kingdom is not prepared for it. And I see this blatantly with cyber, with the cy uh, cyber warfare, with the, the internet as a whole. And that's why blockchain is becoming a priority. However, we, we, we have become so corrupt that the, the experts that could easily help the situation are being pushed offshore. They're being pushed in different directions. Yeah, we haven't received any such indication. And by the way, nobody's really received indication that that absolutely is what is going to happen. Uh, the way that the SEC works is they don't say, hey, yeah, we're going to let you uh, go uh, Wednesday at four o'clock, um, you know, or, or Thursday a week ago, uh, they, they, they will always constantly hedge themselves. We're prepared for a effective date on Wednesday and trading on Thursday. Uh, but we know that anything can happen. So I'm about 95% sure that uh, we will be trading on Thursday. The Bitcoin ETF is going to be a conduit to allow capital to flow into, to the crypto markets. And 
with a lot of capital that attracts the best and brightest developers. This attracts the innovation. This is where where the builders get together and start building things that are needed for the world. And and right now we're in a world of distrust. We're in a world that that needs this technology and it and it needs to also converge with other technologies. And this is where we're going to see true efficiency that benefits the entire world. But before we get there, we're going to probably have some some rocky roads ahead of us. Yeah, this has been a big moment for the crypto industry. So I personally donated, but so did a handful of other, a large number of other companies in the space, actually. So raising $78 million for a super PAC is a big milestone. The goal of that PAC is to elect pro-crypto and pro-innovation candidates in 2024. And there's 52 million Americans out there who have used crypto now. That's five times the number that have a union card. It's three times the number that have used an electric vehicle. And so this is a massive constituency and they don't feel like their voices are being heard in DC. So I think it's time to uh, make sure that people know that being anti-crypto is just bad politics in DC. The 2024 elections, the highlight is crypto assets and central bank digital currencies. The crypto world has pooled their funds together. As a matter of fact, CNBC is calling this a dark pool of money, but it's it's all of the wealthiest crypto investors are are lobbying DC to make sure these regulations are right. So just like the quote I said earlier with with the Russian quotes about 2024 being the year, this very well may be it. Much of happiness is hope, no matter how deep the underworld in which that hope was conceived. Thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe, comment and if you're interested, my Patreon, patreon.com slash fame21more, or my ghost site, dmjr.ghost.io, which is a mirror of the Patreon, except for it except Stripe. Now, we get together once a week, and we start chatting about the markets, chatting about different projects, 